Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And for those who keep coming in, we welcome you as you arrive. You're all in very, very welcome indeed. Uh, tonight, we're, we've got the 15th Margaret Horn uh, debate, and the subject tonight is child obesity, a very topical and rather painful subject that's close to all of our hearts today on this panel. Um, my name is Juna Sullivan, I'm the Chief Executive of the London Early Years Foundation, and um, I have with me a very august uh, set of panellists and uh, even more august, a chair. Um, so I'm just going to introduce them to you and then just do a little quick uh, sort of rationale as to why we're doing this debate and why we've chosen this particular subject. So I don't know how you see people from where you're looking, but I'm going to introduce them as the way they come on my screen. So, um, so uh, we have our, our very um, important chair who's going to keep us all to task today and, and going to make sure that we have a very healthy debate. And that's Kate Silverton, who many of you will know, and but also who is a very keen supporter of children and uh, has written um, a very lively book about how no child is actually naughty. Um, and she and I have had some very interesting debates about um, what we do for the for, for modern childhood, really. Um, just next to uh, Kate is Edna Kisman, who uh, is all about the wonder of me and uh, is working with one of our nurseries on a very interesting change making program, which she'll tell you about in a minute. Next to her comes Monica, Monica Costa, um, who is gloriously colourful in uh, a, a wonderful array, array of colours this, uh, this evening. Um, and Monica leads the uh, London Mumps. And again, has we've had many a conversation with Monica about all things London, but all things mums and London, which are actually quite uh, deep. Um, and then finally, we have Paul Lindley. So um, I, I have a, a long relationship with Paul, really, but particularly because he chairs the London Task Force on Child Obesity. So we have many shared uh, ideas about that and many shared ideas about the future for childhood and what it should look like. Um, Paul has got a very interesting background, including being the founder of Ellis Kitchen. So very deep into the world of food. And, and tonight, uh, our panelists are going to talk um, differently and um, about the subject and bring different angles to it. But ultimately, the question is, with one in five children starting school, and I say that again, one in five children are obese starting school, what can the early years sector do to help to tackle this spiralling health crisis? And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a sort of small question of a hugely complex issue but we're really coming at it from that particular perspective because sometimes when you're facing a subject that's so overwhelming you don't know where to start so what we're looking at is one way of addressing it just one way that might help and why why the early years because there's 25,000 nurseries in the early years and 1.3 million children every day and a high proportion of them have three meals with us they arrive in the morning, they have their breakfast, they have a cooked lunch and they have their tea. And some children will be there all day. Some children are with us 10 hours a day. That means we have quite a responsibility uh, to work with our parents and to guide parents as well as to the best way that we can support their children to become um, healthy, to provide them with well-balanced and properly portioned nutritious food. But also, I think, as Paul would probably pick up later, actually to develop a healthy attitude to healthy lifestyle and how we, um, working with the children, have got the power to support that, especially as children are great as nudgers and uh, can be used very effectively to actually change and to push change in the home. So rather than overwhelm you with statistics and everything else that comes with it, I'm going to actually say, ask our panelists to start talking and then we'll pick up and I'm sure Kate will really push us to make sure that actually we start to, to really unpack some of the information because if I start now giving you all the statistics I think it'll over what is overwhelming and I'd much prefer that we looked at the complexity of the situation through different lenses and then begin to think and pull it together but the real emphasis here is us in the early year sector what really can we do thank you Thanks, June. I'll dive in just really quickly to say hello and thank you very much for inviting me to chair tonight's debate. 
I'm delighted, um, as June alluded to there, um, I have both a professional and personal vested interest in the topic. In fact, my next book is going to bring to focus the issues around nutrition in children, particularly how food nourishes our children's developing brains as well as their bodies. I've got a very keen interest in neuroscience and also looking at stress, how cortisol levels, uh, understanding how that impacts on weight uh, gain uh, for both us as adults and indeed our children. So I come at this from, um, I, I, we want to be really practical tonight, and I just want to also look at some of the psychological elements around uh, obesity, because, and also to help parents, and I speak personally my Myself as well, for whom food has become something other than physical nourishment. So we're talking about uh, the practical elements, but I think it does really help to, to, to get underneath that, looking at the psychological relationship that we've come to have with food as a society. And as I say, speaking as someone who's had a somewhat unhealthy relationship with food in the past, looking to it for emotional comfort rather than physical nourishment. And I can therefore understand when I speak to parents now in terms of the research in my own book, that there's this is a very intricate dance that we're playing and as June says we want to look at the practical elements what can we do but it really does help us when we understand that stress has a role to play um, that there's a psychological relationship that we have with with food that we, we can then pass that to those maybe those patterns that we learned when we were children we can pass that on to our children so how do we support parents there to break that cycle and also of course in terms of food supply in terms of being time poor and uh, offering children uh, in the home uh, packaged food with the, and, and food that might often be more full of sugar than it once was a few decades ago. So there's a lot of, uh, of sort of to, to chew on, pardon the pun there. But I do genuinely come at this with a really sincere vested interest. And I'm really keen to hear from our speakers tonight because they have extraordinary experience, research and expertise that I hope they'll be sharing with us because I think we want to find practical ways to help school staff in particular, as June says, to really provide the very best in nourishment for our children and also to make this really feel supported, uh, supportive so that parents especially feel supported that there's no blame shame element in any of this and I think that's the way that we can affect a grassroots change as well in terms of the sort of parenting community so it'd be really interesting to hear what our speakers have to say what you have to say we'll allow our speakers to to take the floor as it were and then I really would love to hear from you as well to be very interactive tonight so I'll be keeping an eye on the chat and to put your questions uh, to our panel and indeed to June so without further ado let's uh, open up then introduce our speakers ask them to outline I think their their experience and their thoughts to that particular question that June and that we're asking tonight with one in five children starting school obese one in five and we know all the lifetime consequences that can have uh, what could the early years sector do as food providers to help tackle this spiraling health crisis where does the priority lie? Let's start with Paul, because uh, uh, you're chair of London's uh, obesity, child obesity task force. So tell us a little bit about that and um, your experience and thoughts around that question. Lovely, Kate. Thank you very much. And thank you, June, for uh, setting us up today with this really important um, discussion, debate and your leadership in um, everything to do with child development. Um, really inspiring. Um, I've got five minutes. I thought I'd spend a couple of minutes giving a little bit of my background and sort of why some of the things that I think are born from experience, and then a, a couple of thoughts around um, around this subject. And you know, the, the the I must congratulate June on the timing of this as well, because um, we're having this debate in the very week that the latest statistics are out uh, from the National Child Measurement Program, uh, including kids that go to into reception year in this last year, uh, obviously on the back of COVID. Um, and they're not good reading at all. They're, they're very depressing reading um, because now that one in five children is now 1.5 uh, uh, for every child, five children. Um, there's, there's been a significant increase over the last couple of years um, of ch children entering school, leaving the early years setting um, with living with an unhealthy weight. Um, my background has, has just been alluded. I guess there's three things that are relevant. One is uh, I've got parental experience of the early years setting, albeit 20 years ago now almost. Um, but I just distinctly remember how close that relationship is between uh, the, the staff and the team at early years settings and parents, because your child goes and tells 
those staff all about what's happening at home and then they come back and tell you all that's happening in the early year settings and food is an increase vital importance um, there so what happens at home what happens in in the nursery settings um, it gets told both ways um, but I did set up Ella's Kitchen, um, uh, which is now the biggest baby food brand in the UK, um, some 15 years ago. And I guess my experience from that um, is how vital to the whole of life, the first thousand days of a child's life um, is for physical and emotional development. Um, and uh, early year settings can be part of those first thousand days often for, for, for children. So uh, given the environment and habits in those first thousand days, uh, and indeed the first five years are, are vital to life experiences um, and chances ongoing, um, the environment of early settings and the, and the habits that are formed there are critical to, to, to everything to do with childhood from then on. Um, an example about habits um, that we found is that, it, that this golden win window, six months, uh, or sorry, a year from six months to 18 months are old, uh, where um, children will try new foods. Babies will try new foods. They don't have neophobia yet. Um, and they will try new foods once they accept the taste. So um, trying new foods in that, that time, even though they may be rejected for a number of times, like a, a, a broccoli, which is bitter, um, if you keep persistent um, after eight or nine times, the child will accept it. And then they will eat vegetables and broccoli th through life much easier. So the, that vital importance is there again. Um, other things I learned from Ayala's kitchen time was the importance of human interaction uh, for babies' development, especially that mother or father interaction during feeding or, or, or uh, early year staff interaction with feeding. That, that it's not just about the food, it's about the human interaction around the food and around play. Uh, and baby to baby, toddler to toddler interaction is, is vital as well. Um, and I guess a, a, a final couple of things were really around the involving toddlers. Um, in making things, especially around food. Um, we uh, published uh, four best-selling cookbooks, uh, all of which were about involving toddlers and young children in making the food because they're far more likely to try it after they've made it. Um, and finally, the, the power of positive, uh, pra praise for positive behavior, um, which uh, doesn't just mean parent to child or, or, or staff to child, um, it's, it's, it's the organization to the, the team and the staff at the early years, the praise for, for, for great behavior, we all need it. Um, with London's Child Obesity Task Force, I've had the privilege to uh, chair that for, for four years now. June uh, is, is a core member and one of our remits is, is really to uh, change the trajectory of children's lives by unleashing a transformation in London where there are more children in London than there are people in any other city in this uh, country, so it's of vital importance. And we issued a call to action uh, a couple of years ago, which we're, we're implementing now, but um, with 10 areas of, of child's life um, of which we've got specific calls to action on. And two of those areas specifically are in the early years. One is, is specifically around breastfeeding and the opportunities um, that, that that gives to a healthy relationship with, to food and a healthy physical and emotional development. Uh, and one of them is specifically around the, um, uh, the early year settings and specifically in, in uh, training chefs and qualifications around chefs in nurseries and um, in around more, more broadly training of all staff uh, that are interacting with children in a professional um, situation. So five core truths we learned in our time as uh, the Child Abuse Task Force, which I think are vital to think in, in, um, away from society down into an early year setting and a truth for that too, it is environment is so critically important. You know, I think Winston Churchill said years ago uh, that, that um, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. And we live as creatures that adapt to our environment. So how our early year setting is set up, the environment, the physical and the emotional environment that is there affects how children live their lives. And, and, and so setting that, that, that up front is uh, it is vital into the appropriate way that can encourage healthy eating, drinking plenty of water and taking lots of exercise. Um, I, uh, poverty and deprivation, unfortunately, are hugely correlated to uh, living with an un unhealthy weight. Uh, if you live in one of the most deprived areas of London, you're twice as likely to um, have, live with obesity than 
if you live in one of the, uh, the, the richer uh, boroughs. Um, a multi-system approach is vital. Uh, that kind of can mean in society that one solution is not going to work for uh, making uh, obesity a thing of the past for children. Um, but in our nurseries and in our early, early year settings, uh, many different approaches to encourage uh, a habit and a routine of, of healthy eating, of drinking plenty of water and taking plenty of exercise through play um, it requires many touch points. But I guess the positive thing is there's lots of good stuff out there. Individual nurseries will be doing great stuff that we need to try and network and learn from each other. Chefs will be doing interesting things that need to share with other chefs uh, and across society that's the same. So there's loads of good stuff out there in this very difficult and intractable problem. Um, and the final thing I would say for we found as a task force, but I think it's vital in early year settings where you have this huge opportunity to do this is listen to children and families who are actually the experts um, in understanding um, what it's like to live uh, in a, an obesogenic environment or with obesity in the family. Uh, listen, uh, don't tell, listen and learn and then adapt your environment and the things that you can do by listening to those experts. Um, so to specifically answer the, the, the question in, in just a minute or two, um, I think it's all about how an early year setting can change behavior, change behavior of, of, of the parents and the children of the families that are the clients, and, um, but also of the staff. And I think there's three areas I always focus on, and we did as a task force in, in changing behavior. It's offering more capabilities, psychological and physical capabilities to, to do change, knowledge, skills, abilities, those sort of things, so that kids can uh, eat healthily, drink and play better every day. Um, so one's capabilities, two is opportunities, both physical opportunities and social opportunities, those external factors that can make the opportunity to eat, play and drink well um, possible, that behavior change possible, the timing of, of um, those opportunities to eat, drink and play, location and resources that you put to that within your settings is vital. And then the final thing is motivations. How can we, how can we help children, parents and our staff reflect and have automatic motivations so that they want to encourage better behaviors uh, around healthier diets so that it is something to look forward to and something they aspire to rather than they have to do. Um, so that's kind of big picture stuff as, as my background and some of the things I, I think and I'd love to get into more detail as the conversation goes forward. Lovely. Well, thank you. And I'd like to get uh, also a take on your, in terms of the early days of Ella's Kitchen. Um, I mean, many of us will know the story by now, but in terms of what you, the things that most surprised you and the biggest challenges, I guess, maybe that you, you've come up against and in terms of feedback as well from, from your, you know, from the parenting yeah. community would be really wonderful. But let's hold that thought for, for a moment. And uh, I'd like to ask Edna now if you would uh, uh, say a few words, Edna. Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me on the panel. And, uh, and I'm very pleased that a lot of experts of early years education and, and other types of education are sitting, are, are sitting in their homes and listening to the way we're going to argue or describe what we do. If you took a glance in my bio, you will notice that I am not an educator, nor am I an early years expert. So one might ask, what am I doing here? Why am, why am I here? So I want to talk about very briefly about three points of um, credentials, if you, if you will. The first and probably the most important and the most personal is that I have been a, an obese child throughout my life and later on an obese uh, adult. And obesity to a large extent has defined who I am and the narrative, my own narrative and the way some people used to talk about me. And it was not positive. So um, I've taken some steps to ref, you know, correct the situation. I've undergone bariatric surgery and the results are very good. But I'm afraid that um, you know, the fear and loathing of obesity is still lurking in the shadows. It takes a very, very long time to get rid of what is embedded in you as a, as a, as a baby that just starts eating after you breathe when you come out. So that's, that's, that's the first criteria, if you will, is that as one of those people that we are talking about, 
I actually recommitted myself to, uh, to make sure, if I can, that young children don't have to undergo what I went to, what, what I went through, including the stigma, the bullying, and the branding, self-branding and other branding, others branding you as somebody who is less able and less attractive, et cetera. Um, so that's the passion, but you can't really achieve much change just with passion. And so my second credential point, if you will, is that I am an experienced and well-skilled campaigner. And if we want to bring change, you have to campaign. It just doesn't happen on itself, on by itself. And uh, the issue about campaigning is that you have got to be able to know who you're talking to, who really matters, what are you saying to them, how is it relevant to them, what is the motivation you're trying to awake, and what kind of allies and, and, and avenues you choose. Uh, I'll come back to that, but that's another skill set which I think needs to be deployed. And the last credential, if you will, is that I was born a contrarian. I do not do anything without asking why are we doing this? And if I don't like the answer, I tend to try and change it or improve on it. And being a contrarian in a complex situation like ours, the, the one we're dealing with is very, very important. It's actually a skill that is an attitude that you need to have. Einstein once said that, or at least they say he said, that madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, we are looking at the numbers that everybody has already mentioned today. And that's after two strategies of government that has resulted in very little after much discussion about what should the food industry do, that didn't last much either. After many programs, including the famous five a day campaign that cost quite a lot to do, that, that has left not, a, not, as, not as much impact as we would have liked to. And to do something over and over again and not achieve results. In fact, the results are worse because everything is going the other direction um, is not satisfying. And so in order to change, you have to ask some very big questions. You have to query the assumption. You have to, you have to take the assumptions and doubt them. You have to look at what obstacles are in your way. You have to see if there's a way to change those obstacles or do or go around them. You have to fight. So let me just give you know, a few moments on, on what are those um, principles that I believe are worth following. They are not new. You've already heard Paul articulate some of them and I'm sure Monica will too, but sort of these are the headlines, if you will. The first one is that one needs to focus on the primary group uh, that, have, that have the most vested interest in adopting healthy uh, habits. There's no doubt, or there shouldn't be any doubt, that the primary group that we are looking at in answering this particular question are children. We have to, in early years in particular, mobilize their curiosity, their imagination, their enthusiasm, their competitiveness, and we have to be able to put those in the service of making sure that these children, even as young as three, if not a, up to about five, have the opportunity to become skilled masters and advocates of healthy, healthy living. A big ask. Second thing, from this flows a lot of things. Primary amongst them, I believe, and that's part of my theory of change, is that we have to reframe what health and healthy living means to the child. 
normally when we talk about health, we mention, we, we assume that it means uh, making disease go away or making disease not come around, maintaining the status, maintaining the, 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 the way we are and able to function, continue to function. When, unless the child has a very ill close relative, the idea of disease and illness is not relevant. The idea of prevention is hard for children because to be successful in prevention, actually nothing should happen. So how do you want children to work hard and achieve nothing? That's uh, the whole idea of health and what it means needs to change. And I believe that it is relevant to the child to think that health and to believe that health is a means to being successful in school, successful in sports, gaining the approval of parents and the approval of, 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 of teachers, being acceptable socially and enjoying life as, as, and that to me is if we will be able to do that and make health a positive factor, not an avoidance of something bad, I think we can achieve quite a lot. The third item or the third principle of change here is you have got to follow the children in terms of how they learn, not impose on them what is learning that we grew up with and what learning uh, is assumed by the authorities that deal with curriculum and so on. Well, let's take a look at what, at what had, how children learn. They observe, they mimic, they experiment, they play, they fail, and then they start again. And they compete with one another to, to see who does it better. So in all of this information, book information, as we know it, information about nutri nutrients, for example, which so many of the materials in school have, are inappropriate. We have to follow the child and the child acts its way into learning rather than learn how to act. And a lot of, our, a lot of the, the way we, we teach, a lot of the information that's delivered, even as confusing as the discussion of nutrients, children don't eat nutrients, they eat foods. And so the pyramid, the, the labels, the way the, the textbooks are organized and so on are also meaningless. What's important is to attract the child and focus the child's opinion and, and, and dedication to an enjoyable activity. And that is why the wonder of me, which is the social enterprise that I started, that's kind of my third career in my life um, at a fairly old age, is, um, is around play. The wonder of me core idea is to introduce games, digital educational games in the classroom and to use those as the opportunity for children to engage with the topic and do it in such a way that they feel responsible, they feel entertained, they learn subliminally, they are not told that they're being taught at this point, they are enjoying themselves. But we also know that games alone don't just do it. And so what the wonder of me has as well is a curriculum of activities that are as entertaining and as playful, but teaching the key off key themes of the game. Together, they make a powerful combination. As we know from uh, the very wonderful experience of working with Charlene Jeffrey at the Pembury Nursery uh, for the last probably two months. We are almost at the end of it and we are writing the report and the results so anybody interested can have them. Um, and what's important and what makes me very proud is that Pembury Nursery and Charlene received an outstanding mark from Ofsted just a few weeks ago. And what is important to me, as well as I'm glad for her, is, is that the fact that action learning, what we have actually introduced into the, into the nursery was noted 
as an important component uh, of the, of the um, outstanding performance. So that was very satisfying. Of course, it's not just that. The nursery has the most amazing um, vegetable patch, which the, which the children and now some parents tend. The nursery has a fantastic uh, chef in the spirit of life, of leaf, of, of training the chefs. The chef teaches and the children cook. And so the, all, all of these things together make it fun, entertaining, attractive, motivational, and very educational. Which one brings me to the last principle, and my time is probably running out. And that is, we cannot any longer rely on the family alone to be the purveyor and the guardian of the children's health. Not because they don't want to, I have interviewed many mothers in, a, in an experiment that we ran in Wales in, in reception class. They love their children. They want those children to be healthy and happy. They, but what if they live in an area that has no jobs that you can relate to, that you can rely to on? They are victims or practitioners of the gig economy. Some of them hold down two or three jobs. They are also very young. They themselves don't know. They come home, they're exhausted. Nobody has the energy to cook. Nobody has the knowledge to advise the children what to do. And certainly sitting around the table and having interactions around food, almost non-existent. Where they are eating properly as June already noted, and so Paul repeated as well, is in the nursery schools. And therefore it is important that the early age education uh, facilities take on a majorly, a, a, a fairly expanded role in joining forces with the children themselves and the mothers or parents, uh, mostly mothers, I should, I should say, um, in taking on this, this assignment, if you will, and this mission of being responsible for the healthy way that children eat and learn to eat. This tri-corner uh, coalition, if you will, from a campaigning point of view, can be very powerful. Think about the power of the child, the power of mothers, and the power of professionals, both educators and health professionals band bonding together to achieve change. And the change that is needed is, is uh, not inexpensive. The change that's needed is very, very lengthy. It is far, way beyond the political cycle of one, one government or one party, but it must be done because we are heading toward a major disaster and the decision is in our hands, basically. Thank you. Thank you, Edna. Thank you very much indeed. Thank goodness for contrarians um, is all I'm going to say. Uh, I'd like to just pick up on a few of those points before I bring in Monica. Firstly, thank you very much for sharing your own story, because it reminds us that we might be talking about statistics, one in five, but these ones are children experiencing that stigma, bullying and branding that you spoke about and defining, as you put it, and I've been making notes uh, while you've been speaking, a lot of them, because uh, there's so much that you said that's so rich, but defining, you said, the narrative of a life. And I think that's what, it just hits it home. Um, I'm actually researching at the moment to become a child therapist. And I'm looking at the psychology of eating as well and the practical things we can do. So a lot of that really resonated. And I thought I'd just throw a few things in. I love what you just said about the nursery and the chef's teaching. My goodness. I mean, just these things are practical and simple. And as you say, the children love it just to go and see a vegetable patch. And I know that some people say, well, you know, we're in a city, London, we don't have the space. I'm actually working with um, a greenhouse company, an entrepreneur, a social entrepreneur in Wales, producing a very tiny, slim greenhouse, but you can grow little beautiful salad juice. And he's passionate about getting all of this in as many schools as possible. That's something I'm supporting with because when we see it, we can have those conversations and we can go and see chef cutting the 
salad and what have you. So this, these are things that we can do. And the other thing is those psychological associations. And I'll bring Monica in on this. There's much more that I'll come back to, um, Edna, but just to bring Monica in, because these associations that I've been looking at in, in my uh, work, Monica, and, and food, we know from you know, from breast to baby, that first association is food is comfort, right? Wonderful and nurturing, but we've kind of, and this is, you know, I'll speak from the eye and my own parenting, but there was always that thing of you fall over, you graze a knee, you're given a lollipop. So immediately you've got pain. Pain is associated with that comfort of sugar. Edna, you're nodding. Um, deprivation. If you don't do that, there'll be no pudding tonight, taking food away. And in nursery in the school setting, and June and I spoke about this this morning, is that sometimes they're quite big uh, portions for little people. And if they're not finishing, I think sometimes there might be, and I'll speak again from the eye, sort of a fear of you haven't eaten everything. So therefore, if you don't eat your main thing, you can't have anything else. And again, we're sort of setting up these cycles. All of these things can actually be relaxed and sort of understood. And I think if we all understand that relationship psychologically, we can start to make really practical changes and how we talk about food and how we have our children really enjoying and understanding and learning about food and going home and talking to their parents about it. That actually these are the sort of grassroots changes that, that I'd be keen to see. We've got a wonderful question from David, which I'll bring in, but I'm itching to get Monica in into the debate now. So Monica, over to you. First of all, I wanted to thank you everyone for um, allowing me to speak here. It's, um, um, it's a great honor. It also is a topic, child obesity or in general food and nutrition that is really, um, it's very close to my heart because I'm Italian and uh, you know, we are a, a pe people of uh, food, you know, we love our food and we speak about food all day long. And when you talk to Italians most of the time, we, we, as, as British people talk about weather, we talk a lot about food <laughs> and what we are having for breakfast, what we're having for lunch <laughs> next and what we're having for dinner and whatever. We, we speak about food all day long. But that actually, before I, I go into this, because I, I want to also to, tap into everybody's um, um, everybody said something I wanted to add um, there um, I, I'm I'm um, yeah I'm Italian but I actually uh, came to the UK 23 years ago uh, and uh, when uh, my son was born in, in 2006 so 15 years ago I founded this organization London Mums it has become like in the meantime like as a kind of media company as well but you know, it, it primarily that was an organization for mums, to mums, uh, and and as it was a support network uh, for for us all, you know, for us all parents really. And dads were involved and are still involved quite a lot in the organization. But um, and and the first very first campaign to 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 add to uh, Kate's um, <laughs> conversation, we had this conversation before, if you remember recently when um, I, I interviewed you, Kate, and then we talked about breastfeeding. And my very first campaign as a, a founder of London Mums was about um, uh, breastfeeding because um, it was in, in 2006. I mean, nowadays, you know, is the conversation. I think we, we, I really did start this, this big debate about, because I was going, I breastfed for 20 months. And uh, I was going around co coffee shop and bars and cinema everywhere with my baby completely attached to my breast and <laughs> all day in the hug, you know, hug a baby. I had this um, sling and, and, and my baby was always attached to me. I mean, and uh, it became at the beginning, it wasn't second nature. As they say, oh, breastfeeding is second nature. And but it, it became second nature after many months, I have to say. But then again, I think nutrition starts from there because it, I mean, breastfeeding gives gives the babies and, and the, the, the toddler or the children a very, very strong immune system. And this is a fact. I mean, it is a fact. And um, no matter what, I mean, I think we should always encourage mothers to do it because it, it's important. Not everyone can do it. And I can understand because I struggled at the beginning, but I was so persistent. I wanted to do it because I knew the benefits of it. But anyway, this is this is the very first campaign that I did. And then there was a lot of media coverage because we were saying, what are the best places to breastfeed 
to a, a babies in public and there was oh there was this thing oh breasts out in a coffee shop oh that's not great so we we i mean the southwest london came very big on this because uh, it's a full of families obviously but anyway this was the first first campaign the second i mean afterwards i kind of continued as my child grew up, you know, as you know, I actually continued this campaigning and actually started doing workshops in the school um, about, you know, workshops with the children, like teaching them to cook in a very early, like when they were in reception. So very close to the early years, you could equally do them in the nursery schools. And that was really wonderful to teaching the children the, the various elements of the food, taking them to the farms and then showing them uh, where the food comes from, you know, because sometimes I think this generation of children, they don't even know where the food comes from. So we're taking them to the farms and then we're moving on and we, we cooked with them the food. We, we took it back to the school, uh, the pro you know, the produces, the, the corn, the sweet corn, and we were making the food. And um, I think once you know where the food comes, it, it becomes so attractive, right? Isn't it? It becomes, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm a passion. I'm passionate about food. Uh, as an Italian, as I said, I'm writing cookery books with a special, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to reveal this, but a special um, um, fun element with the traveling and, and everything. Because and Monica, food, on that, yes. so, sorry to interrupt, yes. but just on that point, because coming back to that, the June mentioned it about there sort of could sometimes be a bit of a disconnect between the chefs. Um, and maybe parents as well, that they have to sort of go through, uh, you know, they don't often have direct contact. How do we affect change then, doing all these wonderful things that you're talking about now? How do we affect change? And Edna and Paul, I want to bring you in on this, in terms of marrying up, that everybody wants to do right by children, okay? We all want to yeah. do right by children. So sometimes it's just joining up the dots and that practical element. How do you think we do that? And especially, I think June's really highlighted how key it is for those producing and providing the staff in early year settings. How do we bring them on board without alienating um, or, or sort of creating more of a disconnect? How do we do that more simply that to sort of get that passion and that communication combined? What do you think, Monica? But I think, you know, first of all, like, um, get, I remember when I was working within, you know, the, with, with the school, um, with the nursery school, with this, we were like talking, to, you know, to the, the school created this uh, fantastic kitchen, like working kitchen, so that uh, obviously there was like a, 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 the local authorities, um, we, were, we, we pitched this idea of the working kitchen, so where the children could come in, have aprons and all, you know, getting them really ready to become little chefs. We, we kind of had a big deal. So the local government um, kind of was engaged in, in, in this process. And then they gave some funding to create the working kitchen. The, the you know, the, the other teachers, the chefs, the catering company, everybody was in, involved in this process because obviously all the parts need to communicate and then the parents also got involved and everybody there was a rota of parents uh cooking in the school and that was quite good because uh, there was also communication of what kind of recipes they were suitable for the early years and uh, show you know the variation i think it was it was a very interesting exercise from all points of view and and but who's driving that change because it's what I, I i'm fully in favor i think of that was driven change. by the parents and the local authorities okay but that, that was an initiative that was like a private initiative that kind of came from the parents um from the families that's why i was involved in that because of the families were kind of involved so in the process. how do we standardize this edna let's bring you in then and i want to come to david's question because it relates to this but how do we standardize all this good work that's going on locally there is there is a very good piece of research at leeds university the henry project in which uh which has shown that it has good results and there the people who drove the the parents in the in the coordination with the children the children wanted to involve their parents. They issued the invitation to dinner and, you know, and they cooked together and that is how it was set up and it goes on. 
And the researchers have actually decided, determined that that was a major uh, reason for this kind of interaction to succeed. Paul, what's the biggest driver of change in your experience? Uh, it's easy to say it's legislative because that's the big stuff that they can do. I, I think it's actually cultural. It's like how, I go back to my environment point, culture is ultimately how we choose to live our environment. And if we have a culture where food is a functional thing for a certain time of the day and some people are, you know, the chefs do it and if I'm working in, a, in an earlier setting that's kind of not to do with me or, or, or um, at home if, you know, one parent does the cooking and the other doesn't, it, it sort of sets boundaries around a function around food. And I think what, we, what we've got the opportunity to change is to do what the Italians do so well is make it cultural Make it, make it part of everything. So what an earlier setting can do is bring food into, you know, how kids learn to begin to think about colours or to think about counting or to think about play and creating games and creativity. And food just becomes a tool, is used as a tool to help culturally food be at the centre of our lives and not be purely um, functional. And, you know, you asked the question earlier, um, Kate, about how Alice Kitchen started and how it cut through and why I thought it'd be success. And that, it was that exact point. And I looked at the supermarkets at that time, the, the, the jars, everything else was in a jar, was very functional. It hadn't changed for 25 years. Those companies were selling a function. And I, want, I thought, we all, when we have our children, are at our most emotional of our life. Let's work with that emotion. Let me try and build a brand and a company around a parent creating a product for his daughter and uh, relating to a parent, not a corporate, to a, a consumer and, and get that human interaction. Now, you know, nurseries and um, preschools and, and organizations that whether they're social businesses or businesses, you know, can set culture, can set a set of values and can help everybody who's working there believe in a bigger picture than just the job that they're doing. And if, if they're rewarded and, you know, um, recognized for doing that, then, then that can really help if that mission and that sort of purpose of the, the organization is to help children thrive, young children thrive, and if food and play and, and drinking water is part of that, then it becomes cultural. So let's bring June in now then, because let's talk about culture. Uh, you know, Monica said that uh, the way we Brits uh, talk about the weather, so the Italians talk about food, how can we change <laughs> the culture in that regard? How quick is it going to, you know, how long, you know, how, how long have we got in terms of uh, changing the way we see food? Because I completely concur with, with what everybody's just said. What about you, June? You're on mute, June. We haven't really got much time because we have children for a very small window in their lives, really. So I think um, we need we need systemic change, we need, but we also need small changes that make a difference. Um, I agree that uh, food is an essential sort of experience for the children and it's a, a sort of a glorious experience for them. And we, we've always made a big effort of, you know, when you sit down to the table, it looks nice, you use nice things, you know, the children are, it's, it's an experience, There's, they're taught how to chat. I've been castigated, I can't tell you how many times for being old fashioned about teaching manners and teaching how to interact at the table for me these things matter because it, it's a social experience it's a joyful experience and therefore children are likely to test things and if they're serving themselves if they're using nice cutlery if they're using nice uh dinner dinnerware and stuff on on the table these things all matter but the role of the chef i think is really critical to this because for for so often the chef is someone away tucked away in the kitchen but if the oh if they're allowed to open up their contribution to why they choose these foods and how we're going to test them and how we're going to use them and cook them with great joy, with great, um, you know, with great uh, honour about the food. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a gift. It's a gift that we're presenting for lunch and for supper and for tea um, that the children are part of that experience. And I think it's about us appreciating that. And it's not just, oh, now, now it's tea, now it's lunch. Come on, where we go, you know. It's actually, hey, it's soon to be lunch. Let's prepare. Let's be ready. When we sit down, let's engage it. And also, how do you bring the staff into that process? So it's not a situation where the staff are on the side 
eating their own are not testing the broccoli are not wanting to get involved in it because they don't like it are putting their nose up even though they don't even know they're doing it the children are all looking going hmm i see she doesn't like that um but uh, it's all of those kind of things and and when we start to serve really interesting foods you know and use language like you know a, a, a coolie of this and a pate of that and you know those kind of lovely lovely words that develop their language anyway you suddenly elevate the whole process and so there was this how do you move from you know chicken nuggets and chips and beans as the kind of standard child recipe you know child restaurant sort of offer to uh we're doing chicken tarragon on the side and you know with this and with that and uh you know afterwards they're going to have some you know unusual sort of brulee this is the kind of thing that then opens up particularly for children from poor families where actually they the, the, your kind of your cultural capital expands uh, much more widely and also for staff who are a bit nervous about trying all of this stuff wow. that they're doing it in the context of the nursery and the chef is really critical to this because they are the providers of this uh, this is not a loaded question it's a genuine question as in when I ask how qualified are these chefs because when you talk about chefs in an early year setting I'm you know I'm like how 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 uh, qualified are they in terms of uh, you know sort of nutrition and because because my experience of, of sort of schools is, is there's these big companies come in and I don't I don't get a sense that it's a sort of there's a personal investment it's just literally the company decides what's going to be there on Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and you know it's it's kind of it's it's much more functional as, as Paul put it so I don't know just share that with us if you will. Um, the, the qualification, um, a lot of chefs have what they call the City and Guilds level two and three. But actually, we designed a qualification for that very reason. Kate, I could not believe that people in charge of our children's food actually hadn't got a proper qualification that was designed around it. So we actually designed one, which uh, we're very happy to share, but actually, which teaches people about, proce- you know, about portions and nutrition and all of those things and teaches some things around the psychology of eating and food. There isn't one. We've created one because there wasn't one. Yet we send our children to school and um, a lot of the food, and we have had that ourselves in our nurseries, where the cost of the transport was twice as much the cost of the food and the food itself was actually pretty low standard. So you were paying for the transport of the food, but actually the quality of the food when it arrived, you know, was actually pretty poor, to be honest. Mm. So that's why the chef is so important. <laughs> right. I mean, I'm sensing here, if I was in charge of this country, I'd be just bringing you three together and going, it seems like we've got it all sewn up here. Let's just roll this out. Um, I've got David Wright, who's asked, if childhood obesity has reached pandemic levels in the UK, what should we be doing about this as a nation stroke government in terms of public policy? And why aren't we focused on this as an issue? Um, mm. What? Let's, let's just get a thought from each of you in terms of because we can all talk. We all that you know the answers are there clearly. Um, how do we affect change at a national level in the way that we need to pull? Um, well, um, because we're talking about child obesity and children don't vote and their voices are never heard in the, power, in the corridors of power, um, there is a disadvantage about other issues that are in society. Um, so other people have to take up that voice for them. Um, but childhood obesity isn't just about the weight and the healthiness of, uh, of a child or to do with obesity. There's a whole other number of other health conditions that are associated with an unhealthy diet, whether that's in um, uh, lung capacity, whether that's in uh, teeth uh, health, etc. Also, the serious psychological issues. Edna was talking about bullying and her experience before. That goes through life, and that gets that that gets ingrained in the, the development of the, how that person sees themselves, that child sees themselves as they develop through, which goes through to mental health issues in teenage years and beyond into adulthood. And then in adulthood, there's a whole load of associated costs uh, associated with, with uh, obesity, directly to do with health. The six billion spent on the National Health Service that wouldn't have to be spent if. Uh, we didn't have this level of obesity, but also in the economy more generally, if you want to take it really broadly, and the, the ability for us to be productive or to innovate or to, to create spaces where people work healthily, all of that is tied up. So I don't think it's as high a priority as it is because I don't think children are, um, you know, have the voice that other uh, groups have uh, around other issues. Um, and I don't think we think broadly enough around it 
I think we narrow it to, um, to, uh, uh, to a, a thing that is around personal choice. And the, the narrative out there, the person on the street, is that it's lazy people who yep. you know, can't be bothered to get off the couch and eat too much. And all the professionals will tell you, and my experience, June's experience on our task force, where we've worked very closely with live, people with lived experience of this, is it's our environment that shapes us. And if you're living with having to do two jobs because one job doesn't pay enough and you haven't got enough money, so you're not going to waste that money on trying foods that your children don't like. And if the chip shop is closer than Tesco and cheaper than Tesco and you haven't got a cooker and you haven't got an assured tenancy when you're at home anyway, all of those things are going to have your cognitive thinking, uh, even though you care about the health of your children, um, to, to, um, to do the thing that is going to get, help your life and help their life get through the day. Um, and those sort of th- the, the complexity of this um, is 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 not um, recognised in um, you know and we could go on and on and on. The fact that government is in silos and you know the health department doesn't talk to the education department yet both of them together with the environment and business and all sorts of things need to talk to each other. It's a complicated problem, but um, no one really wants to take ownership because we don't have a, 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 a food. Foods are Henry, Henry Dimbleby is doing a great job in, in bringing strategies together, but it's it's um, it's time will tell whether they. they I mean, when we can, you, you, it's a really important point. I know Edna wants to come in. I can see just a very quick one because children don't have a voice. And parents were often, we, we, you know, that whole, Ed, and you mentioned the five a day campaign. And my husband, it's he, bane of his life, he'll pick up a, a packet and he'll say, five, yeah, part of your five a day. You go, oh, good as a parent. It's all about pretty and nature, all. And then you look at it. And then I'm just looking at one of the books that I'm using for my research, you know, sort of two litre Coke, and that's all the sugar. And this mm-hmm. book says, think of it at sugar as, a dic- as addictive as cocaine. So when we're advocating for our children, you know, you do, I get frustrated when in the corridors of power, we cannot think, actually, we are giving our children a drug, effectively, uh, that is as addictive as cocaine, and no one's actually bothering to slap down any company that is putting that much sugar unnecessarily in a drink or a cereal or a condiment sauce or whatever. You know, come on, really? In, in, uh, uh, Edna. Well, I think the, uh, I think Paul mentioned the biggest issue, I think, which is that it is so multidimensional and everybody if they do something about it, will do it because they know what they're doing in their domain. So, so there is no joint up thinking. Maybe the task force of the mayor is the first opportunity that there were more than one kind of person was, was sitting there. There is no joint up thinking and there's not a lot of joint up working, doing things together. Um, there is a project that's called Trailblazers that, had, that has two parents, as it were, the health department and the education department. It is impossible to get information from one to the other, even though they're both responsible for, you know, it's a, it's a pilot scheme to see how local authorities can use their municipal power to make changes locally. Um, And that brings me to the second issue, which is if we're talking about a national level, um, this is a complicated process. This is a lengthy process because you have to undo things. It's almost like analytical psychology. You have to undo things before you can rebuild them. That is not what politicians like. Mm -hmm. And we don't have too many many heroes or symbols of success. you will be surprised I get these daily um, report from Google on stuff that is out there in the press on obesity and stuff like that. Tons of things are happening, but they're happening small places. There are lots of experiments. There's nobody that has actually put them together. Okay, to let, me, let me bring in, sorry, Anna, to interrupt, but we've yeah. got some really good questions around this and good. I want to bring in. So, um, 
So Muriel, uh, I think, so I'm peering over, over my spectacles here. Uh, Muriel says, do the panel have any views on what the barriers are that prevent the joining up of various departments or sectors, particularly health and education? I mean, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer, but kind of we've been here, Monica. Well, I think, you know, the government is not really doing too much about it because there are actually, these big corporations that actually feed a lot of money into, you know, in, into the, you know, uh, coffers banks or whatever. Because at the end of the day, uh, if you see, if you look at the supermarkets, right, if you go there and at the low levels where the kids can browse, I've seen it because my son, you know, when he was little, was going and all the naughty stuff that the children can help themselves with, they're all at the low levels. Um, you know, there are so many things that the government should maybe put some restrictions on or increase the sugar tax or, you know, on coca-cola i don't drink fizzy drink I'm, i mean I, I don't i'm not a sugar fan either but it's me but i i can see the addiction there and the children are just fed you know uh, things that are, i mean I'm, I'm really upset as a parent as a parent uh, from a parent's point of view because obviously it's it's almost like you can't stop that because children go to the supermarket and see these things. They want them. The advertising on television and sugar, you know, all the sugar. Well, Michelle Obama all... spoke about it, didn't she? Michelle Obama said she had no idea yeah. how much cereal there was yeah. in, in, in um, I mean, sugar cereal, there was in, in cereal. Cereals and yeah. You said the cereals before. So do we need, I'm, I'm looking at the time because we want to get some really sort of practical outcomes here. One I'm hearing about, I mean, June, would we talk about qualifications for those providing uh, you know, nutrition. Also, we've had Linda and uh, Anonymous, um, two questions aligned. Do we need to make the early years national, uh, nutritional guidelines mandatory settings? I wonder about that. And I'd love to take a vote from the people um, here about that because, um, I mean, I reckon change is driven by both sticks and carrots, and that would be a stick. But again, the worry would be who would inform that and would it be, you know, we wouldn't end up with a tick box. You know, so I quite see that that could be a way of actually making it at least a putting it in place and Ofsted having to look at what we're doing about that, whether that would drive a, you know, really informed um, sort of, uh, you know, group of people that then have that kind of ripple effect to parents and to children. I'm not sure. I mean, I'd be willing to really look at that and I'd be really interested in what other people are saying about it um, and whether it's made a difference. I'm not entirely sure, having done it in schools, it's made that much of a difference unless you have really good quality chefs and really good quality food delivered in the first instance. But again, in the sector, 76% of the sector currently provide their food from more or less scratch. So people are trying very hard to do what they're doing. But the perception is that they know that it's right. So because you're cooking from scratch does not mean that it's the right level of sugar and salt and all that sort of stuff. Because So I therefore think that actually training around some of this stuff would be one way of shifting the dial on this. But also you can't easily get to talk to chefs in nurseries and preschools and um and those kind of settings because they are part of a team like so do we think do we need to think about a network of chefs where there's a conversation do we need this as a public debate where parents actually are informed what we mean by that and what does it look like i think the problem with the the the, the, the problem with it is it's so big it overwhelms you which is why we wanted to narrow it down to one or two things you could do and then you feel at least we'll do that one thing well and it, we can make you know we can make a change because paul was perfectly right when he identified all the systemic elements that are in there poverty um, policies marketing you know, Monica talked about the, the big business the investment you know it's in, they're invested in getting you know selling these things and the whole kind of you know media narrative that 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 sort of frames this so it, it, it's an interesting one it is. And I want, well, I'm, I'm going to come to each of you to have a specific call to action, if you like. But I do wonder, we've had, got another question around the sort of statutory nature. So this person asks, I'd be keen to know whether the panel feel that the EYFS statutory framework clauses in the food and drink section do enough to raise the profile of this national issue, uh, particularly the example menus. So, you know, in added to a call to arms, perhaps the raising awareness um, you know, but, but that specific question is, is do we think that at the moment 
there is enough sort of raising of the profile uh, within the, the statutory framework clauses. Who would like to take that? Paul, June? I mean, often when they come in, they look at, do we have access to water, which would keep Paul very happy because that's one of the, the task force functions. And I think we're pretty pretty good at that. And I, I think there's very few places that now serve sugary drinks. And we were trying to milk a water type thing. I'm just doing the Makaton at the same time. Um, um, and that's what they tend to look at. There is no consistency in what they look at in relation to anything else. We tell them in one of our nurseries, this is our chef, this is what he does or she does, and this is all this. And they might be interested because they're interested in it. And another person might just say, oh, we're not that interested in it too. I mean, for some to some degree, having a uh, a trained chef and a, um, a program of food that's being checked by nutritionalists, for example, should give you a tick in the box, really, uh, because at least you're making the effort to do that. But uh, there's no consistency in it. And, and I see Grace has asked me to, to how would you frame a question so she could get a survey out now as to what people would say? I'd say, Grace, just say, you know, do a, would you agree? Yes or no to um, setting a set of standards. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I'm not professional in the earlier settings. So I don't know enough about the regulations in this area, but I, I was going to offer a couple of thoughts around um, one around broader legislation and where it's where that, that legislation is taken. Um, and secondly, around things that can be controlled within a, an early year setting by the people in that setting. So the first one about sort of regulation and that is, you know, I've always been a big fan that, that problems should be solved closest to where the problem is give money to the people closest to the problem. So, so taking a, you know, a national, what can be devolved from a national level to a city level or a borough level or an academy level or a nursery level? And um, where, who, who's the best person along there to know what the problems are and how to spend that money? You know, we, June and I work out on London Child Obesity for the mayor. You know, there is a lot that, that the metropolitan mayors can do around setting environments. The mayor in London has, put a ban on new um, planning permission being given to any fast food restaurants within 400 meters of a school. He's banned uh, high fat, salt and sugar uh, advertising on the Transport for London system. Two big, big policies that really affect the environment of how children go about their days. Um, talking about where money, who, who can choose how to spend money, one of our colleagues on the task force um, is a head teacher of a primary school in um, oh, Greenwich. Sure. And what he's done with his pre pupil premium, which could be spent on pretty much anything, he's employed a high quality chef and a gardener. And those two people take lessons. So a history lesson or a science lesson or a maths lesson, kids go outside and they learn that subject through vegetables growing in the garden or through how they're cooked or, or, or um, chopped or, or whatever. But the, the chef and the gardener work with the teachers to deliver lessons, which to, goes back to some of the cultural things I was talking about. But that head teacher has chosen that's how he is going to spend that extra money that that school has. That's the most important thing for him. So I'm really concerned if we're looking at it at a statutory and a sort of societal level, public service level, get the decisions made closest to where the people know the problem uh, that, that, that is. And if we've got one fit, size fits all from a national level, yet we know that childhood obesity is twice as likely in a deprived area than it is in a rich area, we're not going to get the right solutions in both either of those areas. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's that. And then the, fact that the the thing that I would speak about what 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 early year settings can do. One is around networks that doesn't require money, which we're all off, often short of. It doesn't require time, which we're all often short of. But if we can network with a problem that we've got where another nursery in another part of the country might have that solution and find that solution. How can, the more we can get people listening to each other and talking to each other in any aspect of society, I think we, we find solutions. The solutions are often out there. They may be small, they need to be found and championed and scaled, um, but, but they're often out there. So networking early years workers, early years owners, early years chefs together is, is a big, um, a big win. And the, the final thing I'd say that we can control within early year settings is routine. I think that is ex extremely vital to how children grow up. I think that's one of the reasons why we've got very um, depressing statistics that have come out in this COVID time around obesity is because children have not been in a routine generally. 
and they and they they need structure and they need routine to be free thinking and imaginative in that section but if if you know meal time is meal time and, and play time is play time we can build food into all of those things but setting a routine can start in an earlier setting and start with a culture of an earlier setting and bring it back to the back to the family yeah lovely um, and yeah. i'm just thinking as you were speaking actually there is a ripple effect even from the lunchbox that I know my children, when they had it, just those around them, if there were other children eating clementines, it's kind of, it takes that, you know, if one person's having biscuits, uh, then other people don't want to eat their clementines, but actually if everyone's kind of bringing in fruit, there's there's things that schools can do, as you say, tiny changes. I've just seen some of the, there's more comments coming in than questions. So I just wonder, it'd be really nice to get some of them, if you'll permit me guys, just to um, take a quick pause, um, because Linda says, absolutely agree, Paul, promoting health and wellbeing is central to our role as early years educators. This means not just helping individuals to change their behaviours and lifestyles, but also understanding the complex factors that might influence their ability to make those changes uh, promoting health and well-being oh, that's a two of uh, great points Edna so important to recognize the shared responsibility we hold and the challenges faced by so many families uh, Susan says her eldest daughter who's now 25 was premature she came back home she said she took her into hospital she was breastfeeding and she was told that she should have asked for a side room to feed she said I'm really hopeful this wouldn't happen today but to be honest she said I'm not that confident it has to start at the very earliest opportunity um the environment uh, has a powerful impact on promoting or restricting healthy choices completely agree starting with high expectations for mealtime experiences would be great um junk food too cheap and affordable while healthy food is too expensive we need to campaign for the government to change that um, and then uh, Morel says the initial trouble with the nutritional standards in the EYFS are that they are a footnote. Uh, and then also talking, there's other comments, uh, Daniela having partnership with parents to educate and share ideas and activities, make an impact on healthy choices at home. Growing food, getting it to the plate with children in nursery is a great expectation. And I hope that means a wonderful expectation, not like too much. Um, and then again, that help having partnership with parents to support healthy choices uh, can make a massive impact. Thank you for all of those comments. We're sort of drawing to a close. So I'm just going to give you time just now to pause and just think, what would your call to action be tonight uh, what can we each of us do as individuals to affect change? Because ultimately, that's how change happens when we all take a little bit upon our own shoulders to go back and take something away from tonight. And that includes everybody watching. Thank you very much for having uh, stayed with us. Um, and then I'll leave June to, to, to give her final thoughts. So who would like to go first? A final, a, a call to action from you. And also, what am I, as in what of each of you, going to, to do uh, in terms of your own responsibility after tonight's debate? I'd be happy to, to give it a go. <laughs> My call to action would be to continue supporting the uh, parenting community um, with initiatives that like uh, parents driven initiatives, obviously, um, to, to change the way we, we, we educate children to eat, to make them passionate about their food and, and how healthy food is much, much more interesting than junk food, uh, to be honest. It's much more creative, making food with the families, you know, together, you know, people cooking at home is such a rewarding element, you know, making, having parties, you know, where you can cook together. That is wonderful. And I really, I will continue campaigning to, to you know, to educate, the, you know, the, all the parents out there that making your own food, no matter how tired you are, is actually more rewarding than getting a junk food from the next door, you know, shop or chip, you know, chip shop or whatever. So that's my, my call to action. Lovely. Edna? Well... <laughs> I am, I'm going to have a bit of a chutzpah here, you know, of, <laughs> of cheekiness because my call to action is actually to, um, not in my purview, and that is in Paul's purview and in June's purview, and that is campaigns and change happens when you have heroes, when, when you can point to people who have done it and have made a big difference. 
Paul is absolutely correct when he says that there are lots of things happening, but they're too small, people don't know about them and so on. And the Jamie Olivers and the Marcus Rushfords of the world are, 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 not, always are not always there. Would it be possible for the mayor's task force to take on, at least within London, to actually do a real big collation of what is going on that is actually working and make this a campaigning platform to show that it can be done and let, draw the lessons from it of what works and what doesn't work. And then maybe, so before we talk about standards changing, we have to know what we're changing it to. And there's nothing better than the examples of what happens on the, on the you know, at the cold face. So, sorry, Paul. <laughs> Challenge accepted, but um, uh, no, I think, you know, I, I remember being a participant, if you like, an audience um, in when the school food plan was put together about six, seven years ago, John Vincent and Henry Dimbleby went around the country and they talked and listened to schools all over the country. Yeah. And one, I, one of the things I found fascinating there, which kind of answers your point, is in each, each area, they asked the question, what's your biggest problem and what's your biggest thing that you found, that you found a solution to a problem yourself? Yeah. And some people in parts of the country who had the biggest problem, someone else in another part of the country it was their biggest solution. Yet no, they weren't talking together. And because there's so no that opportunity there's... to bring those examples yeah. to life together. We as a task force, our real only power is in the power of our voice. We don't have a statutory power or a budget. Right. Really. So amplify people's voices, amplify people's experience and celebrate yeah. things that are right in a, in a subject where often it is doom and gloom and it's so complicated that we're never going to get out of it. We can get out of it. We've just yeah. shown with, with you know, what's happened is 18 months. We can get on top of things if they, if they seem impossible. Um, and, um, you know, my uh, to, to go on to the, the things that I would call for, for, for action for, you know, one from a legislative point of view, ensure that the training and the qualifications that chefs have in nurseries are of at least the standard that schools have, but, you know, restaurants tend that they should really be if we're going to teach children to appreciate the value of good food from a very early age and help those chefs integrate with the rest of the team within earlier settings or any settings so that food isn't divorced from the rest of what life is. Food should be life. Food, food is the excellent of life. Um, and I, was, I, would, I would answer, I would think about something that Edna also said earlier on about asking the question why all the time. Uh, I always go back to my political hero, Bobby Kennedy, who, who once said, some people see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. I've lived my life by that. Kate, you've got a whole load of entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs on this panel. We all think of the impossible and make it happen. And, mo and many times it's not going to happen. But if you fail and you learn from that failing, then you ultimately have success. And too many times in the public space with public money or with politicians, they're afraid of failure. And therefore, they do the thing that they shouldn't do, which I haven't highlighted before, is they do the same thing again and again and again. In our nurseries and our push on our politicians, whether the local or national, we should be saying we should be trying new things. Some of it might not work. If it does work, great. If it doesn't work, we've learned. It's not a waste of money and we will do things differently and we will learn. But we've got to inch our way forward so that, that there is less um, uh, obesity, there is a better knowledge of food, there is a better environment that our children grow up and it's, it's a healthier environment all around. But we've got to try things that might not work and we've got to be brave enough and curious enough to be able to do that and take a uh, leaf out of, for example, what June does um, it, it is just fantastic. The final thing that I'll say, which I think June should be applauded for enormously and is part of the solution to all of this, is her nurseries bring together children from different demographics. And, and, and so the children that don't see at home, you know, uh, kale or you know a broccoli or something other children might and they'll talk to each other and they'll learn off each other as well as others so you know, as in life the more times we can meet people who aren't like us the better chance we will have a thriving and that applies to our children in nurseries as well yeah lovely a really great point and also just sharing in terms of cultures as well just yeah. encouraging different sort of culture bringing in food 
from the home and sharing and tasting and this might be a bit hot and spicy and this might be a bit broccoli or whatever but you know just also that is helping children in terms of sort of lovely cultural integration as well uh, Linda final point and I think this sort of relates to June really because I'd like to see um, uh, more the missing link she says in many settings is a person who is trained in and responsible for promoting health across the setting and it kind of if we're going to look to June as a as a perfect example I think of someone who drives change um it just a miracle worker it does everything but actually wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have a specific person who is purely responsible then for promoting health across the setting and isn't afraid to be curious and to ask why and feels empowered to drive that change because it's too important a job not to do so uh, I'm gonna I'll finish uh, bring us back together to June on that point and just again say thank you to everyone for watching thank you for listen uh, it's been wonderful to listen to your wisdom and your experience tonight for each of you thank you for all the work that you do it's been a real privilege to be here June back to you thank you um thank Thank you and um, thank you to everybody. It, it's been really interesting and it, it just bringing the whole different perspectives on things I think makes it really sort of brings it life but it's really interesting to just try and see it through the lens of a small two-year-old attending a nursery and what that must feel for them. So I think the one thing about early years is we are part of the national infrastructure and in, in you know and, and that we have to see it through I think it, it helps us to see food as part of that lens. So we are part of the national infrastructure and if parents feel that they in, they're living for the most part in a two-parent economy or a two-person economy and they have to go to work then we have to create the best nurseries in the world for our children and that includes feeding them and creating a healthy environment for them um so that's the first thing i think so it, you know uh, david's point is so well made that you know why haven't we got a national campaign around this that takes us immediately to edna's point about campaigns and change and and how we sort of have you know sort of have a voice and dial up the voice really for children effectively you're right paul we are running children's restaurants we are every day. Those children are experiencing and should be experiencing at a restaurant levels, and so that's in, entirely important in, in in what we do against uh, around how we how we present that and how we think about that. Um, and actually, nurseries generally are trying really hard. I think where our status is so low, we are often forgotten about. But actually, we're responsible for so much. On the other hand, these are parents' children, and so for us, we can work with them. But actually, for many children, we provide most of the um, most of the nutrition actually comes through the nursery. Yet another part, another burden on a sector where, did you know, 5% of the DFE budgets are spent on the early years. 5%. When we talk about early intervention, we we that is that is what is 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 you know, available to us. So we are actually entrepreneurial, and we are fairly good at being creating miracles. So I guess what we can do is we. I mean, I'll take Linda's point about having somebody leading on nutrition. Um, she um already has developed a really interesting program called the Penko program on this, and I would say that the chefs need to be raised in terms of their status, that they are part of the team, and that the staff need to step back and think actually. We'll have someone who's really fixating on this and really hold us all to account because not all people in the early years are healthy themselves. They come with their own psychological baggage around food and about attitude. So that that's an important factor. And then ultimately, what we need is so we need trained chefs who have a great voice, who give confidence to parents, who parents can back us. So we create a cycle of change that's powerful. And then we then we need a kind of media spotlight on what we do. Uh, how we do it, why it matters, particularly as Paul, thank you for raising the issue of, you know, integrating children from more disadvantaged backgrounds with children from uh, more luckier children, actually. Um, and then we need something like MasterChef for early years. You know, why isn't it something to be honoured to know how children eat, how children benefit from good nutrition, how to serve a two-year-old, a fatty two-year-old with a selection of foods in a way that they actually want them. You know, how my chefs, the leaf chefs, create the most glorious birthday cakes from watermelon and, you know, apples and, and grapes. There's no sponge cake at all. And actually, those children, it, it's a competitiveness, you know. Why isn't there a spotlight on them? Because we are feeding the nation's children and they are, you know, it's all about early intervention. If we were to take the £6 billion that is going to be spent on the consequences of child obesity from asthma and uh, muscular uh, skeletal problems, from teeth, you know, tooth decay, from all the other stuff that goes with it, and reinvested that in 
we would have a world-class service for our children who deserve a world-class service. We would have a world-class set of earlier chefs, chefs who are focused on children's foods, where it's an honor to be the chef that actually is cooking. It's an honor to be a chef. You're not someone who comes by accident and loves it and stays. You're out there, you're applying, your apprenticeship is around food, which is what we're doing, food for small children. So actually there's something about amplifying the importance of children and our duty as an as a nation, our sort of Ubuntu of a nation to actually say that we have to do something that supports that and it's not us on our own but we can take one tiny step and show people how it's possible and, and I think so it's about really respect it's about respecting children it's about respecting our responsibilities with regards to children as a nation that's a, encouraging 70 percent of parents have to work um you know one in four live in poverty and 60 percent of them already working Edna made that point very clearly as well and so if we're going to do that then we have to create the nursery environment that's the best in class with more than five percent of the DFE budget but actually with a real kind of glory so that we become like the Italians where food is a glory where food is something to be proud of where providing the right the best food is an honor and that our children have that first experience and if we do it in nurseries we do it with the right qualified people and we honor our children by honoring our food Amen to that. June, thank you so much. Can I also just quickly add, June, because I'm not sure that you saw, uh, but you're the poll, just oh. to feedback for you, the poll, 100%, yeah. 100% in favour of that. Because oh, I think wow. what was the question? I've lost the poll, but it was, you know, in, in terms of being in, in, in um, favour of uh, statutory. Oh, yes, wow. You were, yeah, okay, 100%. well, they win then. I've got to go with that. <laughs> yeah. And then and then also a lovely point Catherine's just made and lots of lovely compliments, by the way, to our, everyone saying what a powerful debate. And thank you so much to all of our panellists and, and again to June. Um, but a lovely point from Catherine just to finish on. Parents should be invited in to share and plan menus within a budget and shown what could be done with uh, £50 a week, which is a really nice idea, I think. Yeah, so um, anyway, final point, June. Sorry, I'll say goodbye and that's it. <laughs> Very good. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. We need these more often because um, I think it's just keeping this whole thing alive, isn't it, really? It's just keeping this whole debate alive and, and serious people like you actually adding to it rather than, you know, we're often think of, people often think of us in the early years as kind of nice, but uh, a little bit dim, you know, but actually the truth is we are changing the world one child at a time yeah. and making a big and significant difference to everything we do. Yeah.